Hello, I'm Charles Hubble, your host and narrator for our podcast series, Deceived, the Moo Years. Deceived, the Moo Years, is the true story of one young man's compelling, at times terrifying, former involvement with the martial arts cult Chung Mu Kwan. Based on his soon-to-be-published memoir titled Deceived, A Journey into Darkness, author-producer Russell Johnson's 12-week podcast combines a powerful narrative and witness interviews with martial artists, mind control experts, and former victims of the Chung Mu Kwan. The podcast will also be narrated in Korean, and Korean members of our production team will be available to add cultural insight as we consider each week, Who is John C. Kim? This podcast is not anti-martial arts. In fact, professional martial artists will discuss how to identify a good school from a bad one. Hello, I'm Charles Hubble, and I'm pleased to have in the studio our show producer, Russell Johnson. Hi, Russell. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Tell me what our listeners should come to expect over the next 12 weeks. During the next 12 weeks, uh, we are going to explore uh, the Chumuquan organization and my time in it. Uh, this episode that the listeners just heard, episode one, it goes back to the end of the story uh, when John C. Kim and the rest of the instructors were um, sent to prison. Uh, starting in episode two, we're going to go back in time to 1980, and it's going to tell how I got involved. And each week, you're going to see more and more of how I was manipulated, how the story unfolds. And I'm going to try to explain it in ways that people can understand mind control and that they could understand how uh, someone could come, bo- come to believe some of the incredible things that people in Chumaquan believe. And so that's the first season. It'll be 12 episodes, and uh, it's called The, the Moo Years. And the second season will be The Anti-Moo Years, and The Anti-Moo Years is the years from 1990 to 1996, where I actually took a stand against Chumaquan, how that happened, what motivated me to um, stand against an organization like them, and how the indictment and happened and the whole legal process. Um, so it, it really is it's going to get kind of hairier and crazier as the, the stories uh, continue. And what I expect to happen during the the 12 weeks of the first season is that we're going to have a lot more information coming forward. Just as, just by putting it out there? Just by putting it out there. Um, there's a lot of people that uh, have wanted to be able to tell their story, and now we're giving them a means to do that. And I expect that as we tell the story that um, I'm going to learn a lot more that I haven't. So you think that new information may come to light as these podcasts are happening, so you think that perhaps starting episodes 13 and and more may be affected by the new information coming forward? Exactly. I I think some of the ones that we've already recorded uh, could be affected by it. You know, I I, I tried really hard to do the best I could to produce the best story and to get as accurate to the storyline, but I, I do also expect variations of my stories to come forward that people are going to say, okay, this is the way I remember it, and this is, uh, this is the way I understood this ritual, this uh, things that happen. Serial podcasts, when serial podcasts came out, there was a lot of new information that came forward. Chumaquan was in about 10 states at their height, and there was thousands of members throughout the country and hundreds of instructors. There was people that they put through this whole process. And there's a lot of them that do have a story to tell, and uh, many of them are afraid to tell it. And, you know, hopefully uh, they'll be willing to share it with us. So are you focused on your experience with Chung Mu Kwan, or are you focused on the Chung Mu Kwan history as an organization and where they ended up? I'm, I'm telling it through my point of view. I, I really struggled for a long time about, like, how to tell the story. Because when you hear my story, a lot of people will find it incredible. But there's people, like I met John C. Kim twice. There was people around this man who most of us consider evil daily. And I I have to imagine that their stories are just horrendous. And there's a lot more stories out there, but I couldn't tell their story because I didn't live it. And so 
I told the best way I could my own story. I tried to get it so when people are going through the series that they see it through my eyes, they through it, see it through my changes, they th- see the things that I questioned. And to what end? To what end uh, are you... What are you looking for when it comes to this story? What result are you looking for? Do you want things to change? Do you want people to examine this particular organization? Do you want people to come forward who have remained in the shadows? What are you hoping to achieve? I, you know, I, I have a lot of different things like that. First... Um, I hope the the general population, by listening to my story, that they'll be use more critical thinking. There, there is a lot of people who don't think critically, especially nowadays, and a lot of the things that happen to us might not have happened if we thought critically, if we questioned things. To me, if you have faith in something, if that faith is strong enough, it should stand up to being questioned. You know, if something cannot stand up to being questioned, it's not that strong. I hope that the the people that were members of Chumaquan like me, I, I hope that they hear the story, that in some way it helps them, that you know they know that they're not alone, that there's other people that have been through this, and also other cult members. There there's thousands of cults uh, throughout the world, and I'm hoping that uh, they can relate to this because. It doesn't really matter the organization. The techniques are the same. The experiences are the same. There's going to be people that are in different cults, but they're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. There are those out there that will undoubtedly call you a liar and say that you made the whole story up. How do you respond to that? I'm fine with that. I I have no problem because that's what I want is I want critical thinking. Now, are, are they calling me a liar because... Uh, their friends said, hey, it was true, and they're, they're taking them on their word for that? Or are they actually going out and doing the research? Because uh, if someone goes out and does the research, they're, they're going to find what I found, and they're going to find more. And, and I'm 100% comfortable with that. And I expect to be called a lot of things. I, I expect that there's some people are going to hate me for what I'm saying, and there's other people that are, are going to understand it and uh, admire that the this, this story is being told. Now, back in 1996, you were criticized, and, and afterwards, you were criticized for going against Chung Mu Kwan, and uh, in a sense, slandered. Rumors uh, abounded about how you were, you were only in it for the money, uh, that you were deprogramming for dollars, that you were kidnapping people. You were saying that all martial arts uh, dojos were cults. Uh, you were lumping them all together. Uh, do you fear that that will come up again? And what is your response to all that? You know, it, it, it was it was pretty bizarre back then. They uh, they actually put it out wanted posters of me. Uh, they had my picture on it. it. Was a horrible picture of I was wearing a camel cash shirt, <laughs> and um, they they said that uh, I had uh, was uh, in a conspiracy that we were kidnapping and pro- deprogramming people for dollars that. Uh, we were claiming that all martial arts were uh, cults, not just Chum and Kwan. And it was kind of bizarre, you know, the idea that um, somebody would go around claiming that all martial arts schools were cults and you're going to kidnap martial artists and sexually abuse them. And it sounds like a good way to get your ass kicked. Um, <laughs> so the whole thing was kind of bizarre. But I, I think one of the reasons they put those flyers out is they actually had the students passing them out. And they had to give the students a reason why somebody, uh, a former member, would do that, would come against them. And for me, telling the story uh, is a passion. It's been a passion for many, many years. And as a storyteller, and uh, you would know that if, if you're going to tell a story, you have to do it because you have a passion for it, not because you're going to try to make money of it. I've spent years and... Um, a lot of money just researching and pulling records, traveling to different places, and it's not a mo- it's not a money maker. It's uh, uh, I, I'm very passionate about telling the story, and as far as if I ever did um, make money off it, I'd have no problem with that. And we're we're talking about a man who screwed a lot of people. You know, this was this is a story about uh, pure greed. Um, he didn't care who he destroyed. You know what he did to them. 
and the idea that they would say, oh, this guy is uh, motivated by money to tell his story. No, it, it's a passion. And, you know, all of us have been working on this story at this time. Uh, it's been 15 months since we started. In the hundreds of hours, you, you don't put that type of time into something unless you have a passion for it. And if this story makes any money, yeah, I, I want to be able to uh, reward you guys for staying with me, to, for helping me, to encouraging me to keep going. And, yeah, uh, I, I think it, it would be great irony to, to take his story and to make money off it. But, you know, for me, uh, again, like if I die tomorrow, uh, like I know we've recorded all these episodes now. You have the interviews. My story uh, one way or another is going out, whether I'm here or not. And that's the most important thing to me. You stopped speaking out against Chung Mu Kwan in 1996, after John C. Kim was sentenced to five years in prison. Why, after all this time, did you decide to come forward with your story? Well, you know, in 1996, um, after it was all over, I just wanted to put it behind me. You know, I was still in my 30s, and, you know, I, I wanted to go on to my life. And my feeling was that living life well was the best revenge. Yeah, and I, I was living in a good place in Vail. I had a successful business. And, you know, I, I wanted just to have a family and move on my life and put this all behind me. And then um, starting 2008, you know, uh, my life started to change a little bit with the economy falling, business not doing too well. And then uh, my marriage started going on the rocks. And then uh, 2011, I, I went through a divorce. Going through my divorce, I'm like, okay, if I'm going to go to through a divorce where I live, I'm like, I want to live next to a bar. <laughs> so I went and I uh, found an apartment next to a bar in uh, a small town in Colorado, and I happened to move next door to um, Kim Rock, and Kim Rock uh, was a seven-time world martial arts champion. You know, it was kind of one of those things is like I was put in the right place at the right time. You know, I'm, you know, late 40s no kids, I'm divorced, both parents are dead. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? And then I, I meet this incredible woman who has this uh, martial arts organization called Fight Like a Girl, and she's teaching women self-defense. And she wrote a book, and she has uh, been trying to develop a movie on her own life. And so we became friends, close friends, and you know, uh, nights at the bar having some shots of whiskey and exchanging our stories she encouraged me to talk again about the story and for me it was like uh, you know I had to really think about whether I wanted to do it or not because I knew that I was going to be putting myself back into a, a position where this uh, it's going to take a, a lot of my time that'll change the way my life goes for the rest of my life uh, but then Kim introduced me to Barry Caldwell who's the director of her film and Barry spent a couple of weeks with me, and he taught me about uh, the different aspects of film, and he really spent a lot of time with me. And he um, he made me understood what was involved in, in getting a film and a book done and the difficulties of it. And then Kim started making self-defense videos, and I got to be her attacker. So it was the first thing. We made a self-defense video, and I, I, I carjacked her in the Costco parking lot. <laughs> And, and so it really, it started my film career. That's happened to all of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's a rough place, Costco. Yes, it is, yeah. definitely, without right. a doubt. Gold and, members gold members are tough on people. So, yeah, I, I never really planned to, to start speaking out again. And you're going to find during the story that there's a lot of times where I was put in the right place at the right time. And I can't always explain it because I've become a uh, skeptic on many things because of the experience that happened to me. But then there's other things in my life I can't explain, like, you know, how certain things happened at a certain time when they needed to happen at that time. Well, from the stories that you have in each chapter that we see, we see stories of vengeance, of tribalism, of prejudice, of bias. Um, aren't you worried now uh, for being sued or attacked or or killed just for sharing your story? You know, when you do something like this, you have to take that all into consideration. And I, I, I do realize that all those things could happen, that I, I could be sued again. I, I'm trying to take precautions against that. As far as when you evaluate a threat, when you look at a physical threat first, does the person have the capability to 
pull off that threat to carry it through. And in this case, they do. The other thing you look at is, has the person in the past followed through on those threats? And again, they have. So yes, there is a realistic uh, threat to me, and I accept that, but it's not part of me saying that I'm, I'm stopping from uh, telling the story. I, I guess when I look back in the end of my life, whether that's tomorrow, next week, or 30 years from now, I want to know that I told the story when I could, and I did the best that I could to tell it. So you want to you want to put the truth out there, and you want to be true to your own integrity and your own story, and you also want to have integrity legally as well. So you've taken the stance of changing people's names in the story. Why have you done that? There was a lot of different reasons. There, there there's a couple different uh, as far as like the instructors. There's people in there that are like me that they're motivated, they're passionate about not letting them forget what they did to us. And then there's another group that just want to forget about it and go on with their lives. And for me to take somebody's name who really just wants to let it go, you know, I, I didn't want to do that. But for us that want the story told, uh, I think there's a lot of lessons that, uh, to be learned in the story that, you know, I, I, I wanted to change the names for that reason. And there's also instructors that are still in this organization that I hope someday they, they realize what they're involved with and maybe they can come forward, leave the organization, and tell what they know. And then also when you're telling a story, if I'm the single someone out, instead of like listening to the story that I'm telling, they might have to become more defensive because now they know I'm talking about them, I singled them out. But to change their name, they know it's them, but the public doesn't. And, and you know maybe they can listen to the story as I'm trying to tell it and uh, not be defensive about it. So you could have told this story by simply putting out a book, an audio book, go on a speaking tour, do some readings. Uh, you could have added supplemental material to an audio book with interviews. You could have done a documentary. Um, why podcast? Book part was difficult for me. I, I, I for you know, I'm, I don't consider my right myself a, a writer. I consider myself a storyteller. I'm a I'm a great collaborator. The epilepsy as a child, it did affect the way I write, the way I see things, the written word. And I don't use that as a handicap or an excuse, but for that reason, I, I collaborate with people. And when I first started writing the book, I struggled. I, I worked with a couple different writers, and they were all long distance. And getting the story to read about me and then actually know me in person, uh, I think they lose that when they're just trying to write about me, and uh, they lose the essence of who I am. And so I struggled with the book. And then my my day job is a security consultant. You know, I've been a private investigator, and I've been a security consultant for years. Uh, this happened to me is the reason I chose to go in that position in employment because it was a safe route for me. And uh, I started with a new company, and one of my first sales was at a live and social podcast network. And upon going to the network, they found out I was a private investigator and said, well, do you have any interesting stories? <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And so it was uh, Scott O'Malley, and I gave him a little bit of my background, and then I sent him some information, and he told me about Serial Podcast. And I had heard of podcasts before, and Serial Podcast, this was in February 2015. Serial came out in October of 2014, so just a, a couple months before. And the way they told the story, you know, one episode per week, I, I like the idea of it. And then I started listening to the Serial Podcast, and it was different than what I've heard. And, and it made sense to me. I, I, I mean, I could have finished my book and no one ever have heard the rest of it. And then Scott, uh, uh, he got a hold of me the next day after reading some of my stuff, and he goes, okay, it's 5.30 a.m. I'm sick to my stomach, but I really want to help you tell your story. Each week during this podcast, we will ask the public's help in answering one question. Who is John C. Kim? Why is it important for you to know the answer to that particular question? It's really been a long quest, a question in my mind who this man is. He came to this country in the 1970s, a janitor, and he, within 10 years he created 
this national martial arts chain, and he convinced so many people to believe in so many things that weren't real. And you know, part of it's like, who is he really? Where where did that training come from? You know, did was he in a cult before? Most cult leaders at one point or another have been in a cult prior to them starting their own. Um, what was his actual martial arts training? Who were the people that know him? There were so many stories about him. Was he part of the Korean CIA? And there, there's many questions we really don't know. And for them, the claim that he's the champion of all Asia, a, a title that other martial arts organizations uh, say does not exist. You know, who is this man? How And where? who is he and where did he come from? Is part of that why you want this podcast narrated in Korean? Yes. To me, it's a, it's a Korean... American story or American Korean story. Uh, we it's a you know a story of American uh, immigrant coming to the United States, and his skills are as a janitor. And you know how many things is he going to be able to do besides being a janitor? So he starts this phony martial arts organization. And so for me, I think it's interesting from the Korean perspective. They're getting an idea of what this man was able to sell to Americans and how he took their traditions, their, their culture, and manipulated Americans with it. And I, I think that they're going to find it very interesting as well. Our producer over in Korea, Tai, is very interested in it, and, and uh, I'm grateful to have a, a Korean counterpart to help tell the story. What is the current status of your book? Right now, the book has been about 75% uh, complete for a while. But that was before the podcast opportunity came along. And what I'm expecting now is that things are going to change, that there's going to be more stories uh, included in it, that um, there's going to be things that I didn't know and things that I'll be corrected on. And we're going to even have a better book right now. I, I do have some agents that are looking at it. But right now I think it's uh, – I'm, I'm going to put it on hold – until we see what happens with this first season. Uh, this first season is really, it's really what's going to tell uh, the direction of this. How has this whole experience changed your life? It changed it completely. I, I left the school in 1988, and, you know, I, I, I went on with my life, and I started going to college. I started taking business classes, and... I never expected to be the the anti mu the the creator of this weird uh, I don't know what you, rebellion against them. Um, it, it's something that uh, uh, I don't know if I, if I go back in time, you know, I, I don't know if I choose to do it again. I, I don't think I would. Uh, I, I'd have a life that was different that I wouldn't know. And from that day forward, uh, once I did. Uh, become the person who spoke out against them, and we'll get into the reasons behind that later on. During the second season, it'll be more clear. My, it, it changed my life completely. I, uh, from doing the research of Chumaquan, it drove me into private investigation. It, uh, I was not drove, but I was pulled in that direction. And my quest to always find out more information and thus share that information with other people, that, that changed who I am. The... The ability to want to be safe that brought in the security part of my life, you know, to put myself in as a security consultant uh, to be protected. So, and, and it changed my outlook on a lot of different things. Uh, for me, sometimes religion's hard. I, I have questions, and, you know, when you, uh, when you meet someone who believed that they were God and the second coming of Christ and... I'm like, well, you know, if people can believe it now, <laughs> you know, and, and but then there's things I can't explain in life. So, yeah, there's a lot of questions. And um, I much rather have, you know, I'm the youngest of eight kids. And my dream was to be a dad and have kids. And, you know, it's not what I ended up with. Russell, how did you meet editor and story analyst David Bruskin? When I decided that I wanted to tell my story, um, I felt like if I could have my story heard by someone who was a professional that analyzed stories that uh, that they'd know it was a good story. And I had this grand idea that, hey, they're going to hear it and they're going to want to make a film out of it right away. 
And so first part, I was like, who, who makes that decision on what films are being made? So I found out that at that time I didn't know a lot about film and I found out it was story analysts. So then uh, the way I am, I looked up the, uh, uh, the best story analyst uh, in Hollywood. So and David's name came up within the top 10 of uh, story analysts and he was, uh, you know, his connection with Forrest Gump and League of Their Own and many of the other great films he worked on. So I sent him a, a Facebook friend request, <laughs> you know, a, a, a ballsy that I am. And um, then he accepted because my name was Russell Johnson, the same as the professor on Gilligan's Island. Um, but then I, I had this I- other idea that I was going to go take a job at a, an airport uh, so I could get the free flight benefits. So uh, my, my plan was that I was going to drive, uh, fly all over and uh, meet with these Hollywood people and tell them my story and then yeah, make a film out of it. <laughs> and so I, I got a job at the airport, and, but it was only three hours a day, paid uh, $12 an hour. And I couldn't afford to fly anywhere. I, yeah, I could get there for free, but had no money after that. But the one trip I made was out to LA to meet David. And so I, I went out and we met at Universal Studios and David took me out to dinner. We spent six hours uh, with me hearing the story. And you have someone of that level take you seriously. You know, it, it, was, it was important to me. It was really what I needed at that time. You know, this is uh, someone that was well-respected in his field, and he's telling me that I have something here. And so he gave me advice, and his, his, his advice was that I needed to get the book done first because without the book I was – putting the cart before the horse. And so then it continued on, and then he supported me ever since. And then when the uh, podcast series actually came up, he offered uh, to help with it. I didn't even have to ask him. And, uh, you know, I was pretty honored by that. You know, David and I have made a connection. Um, It's, yeah, I, I, I feel very lucky, fortunate to have him on my team. Can you tell us how you met Russ Meyer? When, when I returned to Minnesota, I got involved with the Twin Cities Film Fest. Uh, I, I wanted to get involved in film. I knew from meeting Barry Caldwell that I would have to, if I wanted to see the story be told, that I would have to actually become part of the film community. And so when I first got back to Minnesota, I went to the Twin Cities Film Fest and for 10 nights in a row, I went around and I introduced myself to everybody there and I told them this crazy story. And then for the next year, I volunteered for everything. I went to everything. Literally, you, you would saw, you saw my picture everywhere. And then Bill Cooper, you know, like that we like to call the Bill Cooper, <laughs> he asked me to be on the staff of the Twin Cities Film Fest on the social media team. And when the opportunity came along, to uh, turn this into a podcast, I knew that I needed someone that I could work with. And Bill Cooper hooked me up with the Minnesota Screenwriters Work Group, and they put a general call out. And uh, Russ was one of the people that answered. And at first, he, he looked at the project and he turned me down. And he, he said, oh, I, I don't have time for this. And then, uh, and then he took a second look at it. And, you know, for me, Russ has been an asset that has helped me all the way through this because when you're writing about such a dark time in your life, it's difficult because I'll, I'll get into these periods of time where I'm writing for days and it, it's not an easy thing to do. They're usually followed by bad dreams and other sorts of things, and then I have to put it away for a while. You know, I need to step away from it and kind of, you know, exhale and let everything go up. But Russ has been very good about, you know, picking me back up, you know, keeping me moving, you know, making appointments. Uh, all right, when we're going to have this appointment, okay, and keeping me on track. And, and it's really something that I needed. It's, you know, to have that uh, cooperation uh, with him. And so uh, without uh, Russ's help, I don't think I would have been able to get as far as I have. Uh, it, it's not an easy process, and I'm, I'm really a collaborator. By myself, I'm uh, not worth that much, but within a group, I, I, I think that's where I excel. This podcast explores many issues, one of them being 
destructive cults, people coming out of destructive cults, how they have to change their life, how they have to work to get over that experience. It can be a, a deeply traumatic experience to come out of that. Even uh, People are even seeking help coming out of basic mainstream religion. They seek help, and they have to work with how that has become part of their identity for such a long time and how they have to change that and find something new. So it is really, I'm curious, how is the state of your mental health? How are you doing after all this time? What I've found in in my life to help me through uh, times of uh, mental duress and stuff is distraction. I think distraction is really a key to getting through things. Um, A lot of times when I was going through a tough period of my life, I found myself like in a computer class, in a drawing class. The idea was that I could actually choose the direction of my mind that where my thoughts were going to be because it's very easy to get sucked into uh, your, your problems. And there are some very dark things that have happened to me in my life. And yes, sir, sometimes I have a hard time dealing with them. It, it's not a you, know, you live a life that most people could never comprehend. It's hard on me sometimes. I, during this last uh, four years that I've been writing, you know, I, I go through times where I'm like, I can't believe I'm putting myself through this shit again. You know, and you know, is it going to be worth it? You know, <laughs> so yeah, uh, you know, I'm okay today. I'm okay. You know, um, but you know, I have my days. How has this whole experience affected your relationships? It, it's difficult. Um, when I, I, I think when it comes to social interaction, um, and, and a lot of people tell you this, I'm almost a master at interacting with other people in large groups and uh, making connections. I connect really well with people. I, I found that because I've met so many different people within all walks of life, uh, positions, special agents for the government, you know, whatever, uh, nobody really impresses me except for their talent anymore. And so I'm really kind of comfortable with with anybody, but then it, it has affected my uh, one-on-one like dating relationships. I haven't, you know, I've gone on a few dates since I've been divorced. But you know, it's kind of uh, you know, some people have some luggage. So I'm like, hey, I got a whole truckload here. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not an easy thing to. Okay, well, what do you got going? And then people, you know, this is kind of a heavy story, and you know, for anyone to comprehend. Where do you see yourself in the years to come when this is all over? Is there something to achieve, or is this about the being and becoming? Is this about the journey for you? You know, um, for me, I, I, again, I want to look back at my life and say that told the story in 80 years that, yeah, I went through it and, you know, I, I, I survived it. Uh, but it would be nice if this actually became a footnote in my life. That I uh, um, I have found through this experience, I have found film. I I've worked with uh, some great filmmakers in Minnesota: Adam Zuki, Jason Schumacher, Patrick Coyle. I've I've made uh, a lot of friends, and one thing that has exposed to me is that I I'm actually not bad at it. And so I, I I guess if I could continue, if I were to do anything, it would be to continue telling stories to help other people tell their stories. I, I wouldn't mind finding people that maybe had some other incredible stories but are really having a hard time telling it. There was a lot of times for years that no one would listen to me. There, there's this thing that if a story's old, that it has no value. You know, I, I heard so many people saying, oh, that happened 20 years ago. You know, uh, you know why, why are you telling that story? And, you know, until I started telling it myself and developing myself, then people started to listen. But the amount of rejections you, you would get from other people because the story's old. And history repeats itself. And that, that's one of the other reasons that those who uh, do not know history are condemned to repeat it. And we've seen this with cults over and over again. And what Chimuquan did back then is now happening with ISIS. You know, they're, they're taking a different type of approach. Chimuquan, they use the uh, the martial arts films, the karate TV shows. They use the current culture at that time. Now you have groups like ISIS, and ISIS is using the video games, the 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 video the presentation. There's a mind control set that is going on here that is recruiting people, and it is it's history repeating itself. It's just 
formatted a different way. In episode one, you wrote that the government had flung the curtain wide open on the man hiding behind it. I take this as a reference to the Wizard of Oz. Can you elaborate on that? It's exactly what it is, a, a, a reference to the Wizard of Oz. You had John C. Kim. He was this all-powerful leader. People feared him. They believed he had supernatural powers. Anything that was done against him, death was the punishment. And then when he was truly exposed, the man hiding behind that curtain, he was a coward. People that trusted him the most during that trial that went to prison for him, he turned their backs on them. They believed that he could speak eight different languages. And, you know, now he's pointing to, oh, so sorry, me no speaky English. And he cried in the beginning of the trial. He cried at his sentencing. This is the man who's supposed to be the bravest, most powerful martial arts man who have ever lived. You know, they, they believed that he could jump off a 11-story building, then an eight-story building, that he did this twice. And when he was truly exposed, you had a man crying, saying, I, I meant to do no harm. You know, he, he was a man who uh, took people by the throat and asked them to either uh, leave him or die. And, and they chose death instead of leaving him. And... and he, he was, it was a very much that type of story where you have a, a magician, uh, a con man. Um, uh, there was a word for it back then. I'm, I'm trying to think of what they, uh, they called the flim fam, fly man, but uh, yeah, he, he, was, he was a con man. And when he was exposed, uh, his true nature was a coward. Tell me more about his persona that he created. Tell me about the divinity of John C. Kim. When you got higher up in the organization, that's when that became uh, more uh, known. Uh, I knew that it was there to a certain degree, but not to the degree uh, that you're going to learn about in the first episode. And the things that came in the first episode as far as like that he died and came back to life, that came from the Illinois Attorney General's lawsuit against him. And the idea that he was the um, second coming of Christ, that uh, Jesus screwed everything up, and that Kim came here to straighten it all out, that came from testimony of the people that were closest to him. Yeah, it, it, and it's, it's very hard to believe that people this day and age could believe that, but they did. And it's very interesting. I, I've studied a lot of cults, and all the cults that I studied— the people in Chimacuan probably believed more than any other group that I, I have come across. They were asked to believe more unbelievable more stories? Unbelievable stories the, the, that were contributed to martial arts training, you know, these stories, uh, you know, people being able to run on water and heal anything. And um, there were stories that John C. Kim could literally change into anybody or any type of animal that he could. He was a shapeshifter. There, there were stories like this, and you, you got to wonder, like, how do people come to believe this? And that's one of the things I try to explain through the story is the techniques that they used to make people believe, believe these things. Your story takes place from uh, the time of 1980 to 1996. Now, these were, the, these were the time periods of your life. This is sort of the timeline of your experience with Chung Mu Kwan. Or is there another reason why you focus on these that particular time span? Um, there, there's a couple different reasons. The first is that's the years that I was active. Um, 1980, I joined. 1996, John C. Kim was sentenced to five years in prison along with uh, 13 other of his instructors. And during that time, it was known as Chung Mu Kwan and Chung Mu Do. And after that time, they changed the name. And my time is where that I feel that my knowledge is from those time periods. I, I don't have knowledge of uh, everything they're doing right now. I have questions on some things, and I'm not even mentioning that organization by name. Uh, some of it's legal. I, I've been advised by uh, my attorneys that this is probably the best way to go about it, that I stick with the time periods in which I was involved. And it, it was difficult. You know, there, there was a lot of things that I had to think about, like, how do I tell the story? But there is a reaching back in some ways because you would like to know 
who this John C. Kim is, yes. where did he come w- from? W- so without a, a doubt. So it, it, a it, historical it, part of what you're trying to learn, but the most, mostly what you're writing about is between 80 when you joined and 1996 when the courtroom trial happened. That, that's correct. Now, I do, I do want to go back. You know, we, we do talk about when they opened up in the 1970s, and we give some of that history. And as we go on, I, I do want those questions. You know, you know who was? You know, we know that Wang Po didn't exist, who he claimed to be his master. So who actually did train him? You know, what was his military background? And, and by answering these questions, it also prevents them from pushing out to the public the lies. It, it, it exposes like, okay, this is what we act. This is what the Korean government is telling us. Uh, where he was, where he trained. So it's, it's also the being able to stop them from telling the type of lies that they're telling. You've mentioned a number of stories that are attributed, supernatural stories, uh, amazing superhuman feats that are attributed to John C. Kim. In the opening of your podcast, you wrote that people believe that John C. Kim could walk up the sides of buildings, that he could change the size of his limbs that he could <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. uh, that he could do a number of things was the the walking up the side of the building is that a story that you personally heard Th- that one actually came from the court records and and so many of the stories that you're going to hear um, from uh, the first episode and, and throughout the series come from either witness testimony, court records, uh, news reports. I had gathered uh, a lot of different records and reports throughout the years. I had never heard of him walking up the side of the building, and that actually came through the court file. And uh, a witness had testified that he believed that John C. Kim could levitate and walk up the sides of buildings. Now, I, I, you know, if, if he can jump from an 11-story building uh, without being harmed, why not levitate? You know, or walk up the side of a building, why not? <laughs> and that is the leap that many people of faith will make. If, you know, for instance, if we were to look at something as mainstream as the Bible, we would say, well, why not, um, if, if God is a supernatural being, then all things are possible. Surely he could make the world in seven days. Surely donkeys can talk. Surely unicorns existed. Surely men lived with dinosaurs. And so all things become possible once you establish a metaphysical reason or a, a fairy tale of the, the center of the belief system. Yes? Yes. Um, you know, as, as children, you know, that's the thing, too, is when, when we're children, first thing that we're, we're, uh, we're taught is we're taught to believe in the two fairy, Easter Bunny, Santa Claus... Uh, we believe these things are real. And I, I think that this is kind of an extension of that. You know, the, John C. Kim was like the Santa Claus, you know, uh, but for adults. <laughs> you know, the, the, he, all these mystical things he was able to do that people believed in. And uh, yeah, I think it's kind of an extension of that whole idea. You spent a long time in the dojo learning the lessons. Was there, was there some actual martial arts that you were taught, and do you feel that you actually mastered some various forms and some various moves? There, there was, there was uh, martial arts that I, I had learned um, through uh, my instructor who we're calling Aiden, Aiden in the, the series. He, he was a, a very skilled fighter. I did learn a lot of movements from him and a lot of techniques. And then when you're trained in a certain way where, you know, some days you don't sleep, for days in your training, uh, the, the, the forms, the movements become embedded in your brain. You know, there, there's things that are, are just instinct after a while. And, you know, uh, I do feel that when it comes to some of the movements that they will come out. Now, that being said, we didn't spar. Okay. And, and so, to me, the truth of a dojo is actually being in the ring to actually go against someone who can kick your ass, to, to compete about someone, to, to be afraid, to feel that fear before a fight, and it didn't happen there. So, like, could I compare myself to a UFC fighter? No. It, it wasn't the same thing. I, I think uh, 
uh, my feeling was in Chumaquan that there was few people could, that could move around, that could defend themselves. But there was a lot of people who, who couldn't, that they, they were fooling themselves. And I think that if they were to actually get into the ring with someone that was the level that their belt represents, they're probably going to get their ass kicked, especially in a UFC-type style. And the thing is, is like we believe that we were learning the most powerful and deadly martial arts known to man. That's what we were told, right? But, you know, to me, like the proof's in the pudding, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's one thing to say that, but, yeah, you know, get it, get in a, a cage and, and prove it, right? And so, yes, I did learn some valuable martial arts. There was things that I liked it, I wouldn't have been in there so long if I didn't like some of the things I was learning. But do do I I, I think that uh, they're as good as they they think they are? No, I don't think they are at all. You know, um, there must be some pride in the various achievements that you accomplish, some physical achievements, so some um, uh, some pride in uh, in the struggle in in what you what you learned. Maybe you weren't tested. In a, you, you know, it was more, the, uh, I guess my pride is more that I survived it because um, in the beginning I found that the experience with health was healthy. It was good for me. Of course, that's when they're indoctrinating me. But as the time went on, it became more destructive. By the time I was first degree black belt, I was in the worst condition of my life. You know, making it to that level, they, they had me believe that, okay, I'm going to get to this level and... You know, everything's great at first degree. It's yeah, it's still the first, it's the beginning, but, you know, you achieve this. But then you get there and there was this letdown because what they had promised you was not there. You know, when when you stay with something for so long and you achieve those belts, yeah, there's some pride to that, you know. But at the same time, each level I was kind of selling myself out and I was changing and uh, I was becoming more what they wanted and what I wanted. We've had a great time in the studio doing this for, we've been recording for about a year now. A year now, yeah. And uh, we've got to hear the stories at various times. We've had to stop recording because we're laughing so, so long. <laughs> and I oftentimes will turn away from the mic and look at you with a disbelief <laughs> and, and, and great amusement. Some of this stuff is very funny. I'm sure that it wasn't funny at the time. And I'm sure that there must have been a phase of of looking back on some of this stuff with some guilt or even shame. I didn't talk about this earlier, and one of my motivations is um, as I started to learn how to sign up students and as I went out and I advertised and I went door knocking for them, you know, just, just like uh, other cults have door knocking and recruitment, Chumaquan had the same thing. You know, we went out there, we, we passed out our flyers, our blue literature, and I recruited people into this organization. And when I, I did this, I know I changed people's lives. And, you know, how many people that I got involved with this organization, yeah, and I think that, that weighs on a lot of us is, you know, we... You know, we thought that we were doing it for their own good, but uh, we weren't. Uh, yeah, and, and so some of that weighs on me. And then, you know, when, when you're told to assault somebody who just came in to inquire for self-defense because they want to they learn how to defend themselves and the place that they go to is the place that assaults them, you know. I, you know and uh, be told by your instructor, oh, uh, hit your friend, hurt him. And you do it. And, and, you know, how did my mind get to the point where I changed that I was just blindly following orders? Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I became at the end. And I, there, there had been a lot of self-reflection uh, of the things that I did. It's interesting that you talk about going door to door. Isn't, isn't it interesting that we can sort of look at beliefs that we have, uh, religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs and how they take on a sort of viral nature that they exist to propagate themselves by going out to knock on doors and reach out to people to infect them, to get them involved, and that that's the only way that the belief 
can be propagated is if you if you reach out and and spread your belief to that person hoping to get them to take on the belief which is behavioral uh, change because they wouldn't do things or behave in a certain way without that belief. So it's much like the, the cold. The cold needs me to sneeze on you so yeah. <laughs> that you get the cold too. Exactly. So it you have to reach out to, to spread uh, and, and, the belief. And when you do that, though, your own self-value. So to go and recruit another person, as you're recruiting that other person, your own self value of what you're selling increases. Uh, I believe that's cognitive dissident dis- dissonance. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the whole idea that you know you're you're giving more to bring other people in. Uh, your the value of what you have, what you're trying to sell. You know, you're becoming the advocate, the uh, the person who represents that uh, that movement. It's fascinating. This is a fascinating story. And I am honored to be a part of it. Thank you. I, you know, well, thank you for helping me tell the story. Um, uh, you, I, you know, to find someone who has your talent to be able to relay the message, um, it's very necessary, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much.